folks. Time to jump right into it. Today we're doing the Egyptian Coven. As I'm sure you gathered from the last profile, I'm kind of looking forward to this one. Yeah, you'll find out once we get into it. We're actually going to go in order this time uh, because their order of relevance actually makes sense. Amun, Benjamin, Kevi, and Pierre. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing any of those incorrectly or putting too much American twang on them. All right, let's not waste any time and just jump right into it. All right, the Egyptian coven is one of the oldest covens, if not the very oldest in existence. Because, you know, civilization started with the Egyptians, right? The remaining coven is just a fraction of the size of the original, but they still hunt on their traditional lands. Why? It's real sunny in Egypt, and uh, you have to stay hidden now. Why wouldn't they leave? Oh, well. I'm starting with Amun. There's his movie self. He was born before 2500 BC. Of course, we have no idea when or who turned him because that would involve thinking. He's from Egypt, of course. He's 5'8". Wow, she didn't make him a giant. I'm amazed. Usually she likes to do that. All right, physical description. Amun's pale skin has a slight olive cast. She should have stopped there. Because that's what she always does when she says they're olive-toned. But no, no, no. For some reason, Meyer felt it necessary to add indicating the darkness of his skin before transformation. Meyer, don't do that. Don't do that. You know why? This is why. Look at how high that count is right now, guys. Don't do that. All right, no supernatural ability. And he's a leader of his coven. All right, members of the Egyptian coven, including Amun, existed as individuals for centuries before the Romanians rise to power. After the Romanians began to grow as a coven and dominate their part of the world, several solo vampires and vampire couples joined forces to protect their dominance in the Nile River Valley. Unlike the Romanians, they did not form a guard of subordinates or try to overthrow other vampire covens. The Volturi are so evil, guys. They're so evil. Yeah. And also, joining together to protect themselves, that kind of goes against everything Meyer tried to establish to make the Cullens oh so special, that they can join together. The vampires are doing it fine! And of course, similar to the Romanians, they kept many human slaves and lived as gods. Again, I repeat, the Volturi are so evil! Had the Romanians continued their expansion of their empire, eventually they probably would have tried to overthrow the much smaller Egyptian clan before the Romanians had time to move that far south. However, the Volturi attacked. The Romanians were taking over the world. They were taking over the world. They were moving across the nation. They were, mo they were going to basically enslave all of humanity. They were attacking other covens, refusing to let anyone challenge them. And yet, we're supposed to think the Volturi are evil. We are. Look at this. A century later, after the Volturi had soundly won the war against the Romanians, they continued their march against other covens that lived ostentatiously. Their next target was Egypt. Again, the Volturi began with an attempted at diplomacy. They sent ambassadors to the Egyptian, quote, gods, explaining their cause and asking the Egyptians to comply. For the most part, the Egyptians were furious and refused to grant the Volturi any power over them. Yeah, we're clearly supposed to think the Volturi are bad guys. How? What? How can you possibly ask us to think of the Volturi as bad guys when they did this? The Romanians were trying to enslave all of humanity and were wiping out all other covens who dared challenge them. Which is exactly what the Volturi did, only there's a little tiny difference. The Volturi didn't enslave humanity. Guess who looks better? And the fact that the Egyptians did this too doesn't speak well for the Cullens because now not only did they welcome the Romanians into their home, they've welcomed the Egyptians into their home as well, who were doing the exact same thing, just on a smaller scale. Although I have to say, Meyer, saying the Egyptians set themselves up as gods, are you saying that... All of the Egyptian mythology, all their gods were vampires. Stargate did it better. All right, only one Egyptian pair changed sides, Amun and Kebi. Amun knew that if the Volturi were able to overthrow the Romanians, the more peaceful Egyptian coven would be easy prey. And he was right. The Egyptians were totally decimated in only five years. 
I find it hard to believe that he's the only one who knew that challenging the Volturi was a bad idea. <laughs> Are the others just that stupid? And considering what I know about Amun, what's coming up, keep that in mind. Because a vampire dumber than Amun is really hard to come by. You'll see what I mean. Right, he was willing to follow the battle of the old Volturi if it kept him alive, and Kevi followed his choice without question. However, Amun was always bitter at having to surrender his former lifestyle. He loved the worship, the towering desert monuments. The pyramids were built to vampire. I'm not gonna bother. I'm, no. Okay. And the excess. Again, our heroes, guys, they willingly welcomed Amun into their house and asked them to be their ally. He knew he could not plot against the Volturi because Aro would find out, but he hoped that over time he could gain the strength to oppose him. He had learned from the Volturi methods and he sought out talented humans and vampires. Okay, I can't plot against him, but I'm hoping that with time I can plot against him. That makes no sense. This, however, does. I'm going to read this whole paragraph nonstop, okay? And I want you to listen because this is funny. Unfortunately for him, Aro was well aware of Amun's true desires. Aro felt the need to let Amun survive in the first place as an example to other covens so they could see the truth of the Volturi's offer. As long as they did as the Volturi commanded, they could live. Aro always kept a close eye on Amun's movements afterwards, so Aro was able to identify individuals Amun was trying to integrate into his own coven and, if they had a valuable talent, invite them into the Volturi guard first. Sometimes he was too late, and Amun found a good prospect first. Dimitri was one of Amun's acquisitions, but with Chelsea on his side, it was not hard for Aro to woo people away from Amun. In many other cases, Aro would simply accuse a coven of a crime and when he wanted one of their talented members. He'd kill the rest and save the special one, but Aro enjoyed toying with Amun too much to end his life that way. Y'all got that? Do you all get that? I'll spell it out. Amun repeatedly collects talented vampires or humans, changes them if they're human, and then keeps them at his side and then Aro sweeps in and takes them. And Amun keeps doing this over and over. He handed Aro Dimitri. He keeps repeating this. And Aro is just leaving him alive because he thinks this is funny. Amun is basically helping to bolster his forces because he keeps seeking out these talented vampires and he's obviously very good at it. And Aro just keeps taking them. And Amun keeps repeating it. We got that? One more. Over the centuries, Amun gave up trying to create his own talented force. However, when he stumbled across Benjamin, who as a human was performing, quote, magic tricks in the street of Cairo, he began to dream again. He became a total recluse, keeping Benjamin a deep secret by avoiding contact with any vampire or human who might cross paths with the Volturi. He treated Benjamin as a son, and Benjamin viewed him as a father. Okay, not kind of comment on that last line yet, but... Then he caught Benjamin and said, Oh, well, surely with this one, nobody will find out about him. Aro has found out about every single one of his talented members. And he now has Dimitri on his side. So Aro can find Amun anytime he wants. And Amun knows this. Because Amun made Dimitri and so knows his power. But he's sitting here thinking, I've surely got him now. Benjamin's the one he's not going to take. What a fool. He's defeated us numerous times. What makes him think he can do it again? You are the biggest moron I've ever seen. I feel it necessary to use this image that I've used countless times in my recaps. Hey, Amun, you're an idiot. This guy is the dumbest vampire in existence. That's all there is to it. He is the peak. This guy, I cannot believe this. You know, that's technically, the, everyone says that. That's the definition of insanity. Repeating the same thing over and over and over again and hoping for different results. Did he think Aro was truly just going to leave him alone? He's been enjoying himself far too much. No, he was going to eventually find out about Benjamin. Spoiler alert, we find this out in Benjamin's profile. Amun just thought, well, I'll keep him in a hole. Well, that'll make sure no one knows where he is. Yeah, never mind, he's got Dimitri. He can find you. 
Recluse, being a recluse doesn't matter. Keeping yourself out of contact doesn't matter. If he takes into his mind, gee, I wonder what Amun's up to. I haven't heard from him in a while. He can find you. There's a theory going on in the calm that vampires are idiots. That the change turns you, it, it just solidifies your brain and you become a moron. And you're such a moron that you don't even know how much of a moron you are. Here is walking, talking proof of that right here. How did this guy become the amazing Egyptian god? I don't think he even knows how to put on his own shoes at this point. I got nothing else. I really don't. This guy, it, normally I would be still continue to be horrified by what he has done because he is one, he is similar to the Romanians, just on a smaller scale. He had slaves. He had sex slaves. Yeah, he was raping human women, which also begs the question of why weren't there more zombies? Did he just eat them? Must have. But yeah, the point is, I cannot find my, it in myself to continue being horrified by his atrocities because he's such a friggin' moron! I'm just laughing at him. And I'm not the only one laughing at him. Aro's laughing at him, too. He's an idiot. I may as well just finish his profile and remind you, he, uh, yeah. Uh, he treated Benjamin as a son, and Benjamin viewed him as a father. The only big falling out they had in the early years of their coven was when Benjamin lived briefly to create his own mate against Amun's wishes. What's that comma doing there? Benjamin was quickly forgiven when he returned with no harm done. We're going to save that, because now we need to read Benjamin's profile. I'm not doing his famous quote because I want to save that discussion. This one's for later. Uh, I'll tell you the famous quote in the actual profile itself. When I, uh, not the profile, the chapter, chapter 34. Because it's kind of important. It ties back to his personality. Yeah. Okay, Benjamin, Benjamin. Every time I see that picture, I just feel bad. And as we know from the movies, he speaks perfect English because he went to Cambridge. And if you know what I'm referencing, good on you. All right, he was born between 19, uh, 1790 and 1800, and he was turned between 1805 and 1820 at the age of 15. What, I, I know I always yell about this, but I, I am seriously wondering what Meyer is doing with these vague ranges. Is she trying to give herself more leeway? Leeway for what? Just pick a date. And 15 seems to be the cutoff date when it becomes appropriate. All right, he has black hair, he's 5'7", and he appears to be a teenager. That's because he is. He's 15. And also, if he's 15, it seems that the transformation is kind of ages you up. Because in Twilight, even though this was never mentioned again, she said all the Cullens looked like they were supposed to be in college when they're all teenagers. So why wasn't he? Okay. Pale skin, slight olive tone that is evidence of his much darker human skin. I remind you again... This is how high this count is right now in Breaking Dawn. Please stop that. And as we also know, he is the frickin' Avatar, or Captain Planet, if you prefer. He can influence the elements, all of them, similar to telekinetic powers. He can bend the world to his will. Do you have any idea how powerful that is, Meyer? No, you really don't. Otherwise, you wouldn't have us all be wowed and dazzled by Bella's ability. Alrighty, as a human, Benjamin grew up in the slums of Cairo. As a young child, he lost his mother, and he had no knowledge of his father. He was raised by his mother, ex mother's extended family, handed around from grandmother to aunt to cousin, whoever was able to feed him at the time. Uh, I'll get later. Eventually, he ended up in the hands of his mother's uncle, who was a street performer, who took in unwanted young members of the family and taught them to sell and sing, uh, dance and sing for money, sell trinkets or pick pockets, whatever they were most adept at doing. So did Benjamin fall in with the artful dodger? Is that what you were going with? Okay, sometimes he also profited from selling the children that they were no good at earning him money. Oh, God. I do have to ask, when they're young or when they're women, why does Meyer feel it necessary to make them suffer before they can officially join into the vampire world? Is this some kind of weird metaphor that I don't know about? The uncle discovered Benjamin's strange ability to control fire. Okay, he could only control fire. So how did he get all of the elements? That makes no sense. He could only control fire. And I'm not even going to bother talking about how stupid that is. Because I have yelled about the magic aspect. Okay, Benjamin became the most profitable of the uncle's family and therefore very dear to him. That's not love and caring, Meyer. I don't know why she thinks exploiting someone means you care. 
Among the children in the uncle's care was a girl named Tia, a distant relative of Benjamin's. Oh, good. They were keeping it in the family. Lovely. Tia was an intelligent, serious child, and she and Benjamin grew very close. They watched out for and confided in each other. When Benjamin was 15 and Tia was 12, they decided someday soon they would run away together. Did I mention these two become romantically entangled? Ew. And Amun observes the show. Everyone wants to see the amazing boy who can control fire. We heard about the kid who dances. Okay, after so many frustrating losses to Aro, Amun did not hesitate. I've lost a million to him already. Surely I won't lose this one. He's the biggest moron in existence. He's dumber than Bella Swan. He's dumber than Bree Tanner. Do you know how hard that is to do? And then he snatched the boy from the street that night in the process, killing the uncle whom Benjamin was walking home with. We all got that? Amun kept Benjamin hidden in his undiscovered buried temple for five years. He and Kebby took turns hunting and bringing home food to Benjamin. He was never allowed to leave, so there was no chance someone would see him and mention him to Volturi. Need I remind you, Benjamin thinks of Amun as his father. Okay, Benjamin, I know you grew up without a father, but that's not how fathers behave. I don't think we can rack up inexperience to why he would consider Amun a father after this. He's walking home innocently with his uncle. Some random guy murders his uncle right in front of him and then turns him without his permission into a vampire and hides him in a hole for five years straight, all while bringing him people and saying, you have to eat them. And he's so uncontrollable, he can't help but kill them. And yet, oh, Amun, I look up to you so much and think of you as a father. How does that equal I think of you as a father? New theory, guys. In almost every case, with very few exceptions, when you get turned by the, the vampire who turns you, you develop a sick sense of Stockholm Syndrome and absolutely have to love them. You don't get a choice in the matter. I mean, seriously, what the hell, Meyer? Don't you think? Oh, I see. Never mind. It, it makes perfect sense. Amon was honest with Benjamin to an extent. He told Benjamin the Volturi existed and to want to steal him for themselves. He explained that... The Volturi would use their gifts to enslave Benjamin to take away his free will. However, Amun did not tell Benjamin why he himself wanted the boy as a talent that could be added to his own coven in the hope of one day defying the Volturi. And he treated him as his son and never let on that Benjamin's talent was what he was really after. Right. Because when you treat someone as your son, you kill their uncle in the process and uh, keep them in a hole for five years and make them kill people. That is truly fatherly behavior. I don't need to say anything else. And also, one of the good guys... One of the good guys. And Benjamin responded to Amun's apparent kindness. He respected Amun and loved him as a father. You know, Benjamin, you're real stupid too. How can you not tell what Amun's after? I changed you out of the goodness of my heart to keep the Volturi from finding you. Yep. Right. I'm done there. Response to Kebby was less strong because Kebby did not show much affection for the boy. Amun was the center of her world and all she really cared about. Again, we'll be getting to her in a few minutes. Amun spent a great deal of time developing Benjamin's ability. He was overjoyed by the promise that he'd seen in the human boy was more than answered in the young vampire. Benjamin was not only to control fire easily, he also developed the ability to manipulate other elements. Wind came to him first after the fire. And that would happen after you eat Taco Bell. <laughs> I'm 12. And then Earth and finally water. It was clear to Amun that Benjamin was an unprecedented find. No one else like him existed in the vampire world. Again, Meyer, you're undermining Bella, which I know you didn't intend to do. Amun was cautiously hopeful that his luck had finally turned. Again, surely the Volturi won't find this one. And of course, the funny part is, as we know in Breaking Dawn, yep, they do. <laughs> After Benjamin had completely outgrown the new word madness, he began to think more and more of Tia. Though his memories of her were dim, he remembered enough to worry about what would become of her without his protection or his uncles. Amun tried to convince Benjamin that human problems no longer applied to him without success. Amun kept him as busy as possible, developing his talents and educating him in the arts and sciences. Why? Why would he care about that? But Benjamin still found ample time to privately agonize over Tia's fate. Amun won't let him look for her. It's far too dangerous to risk discovery. And then five years later, he ran out when Amun was hunting. By trapping Kebby with a small cave-in. Why didn't she just dig her way out super fast? And yeah, very inventive of you. I'll cave her in! Um, why not surround her with a circle of fire? That works real well in Supernatural. And vampires are afraid of fire. Or why not manipulate water to chain her up. You know, do, do something, but no, I'll just cave her in. 
right, he hunts on inconspicuously, leaving no traces that might be reported to the Volturi, hid during the day. Then he found Tia's trail and finds her in Suez, where she'd been sold for a modest dowry to a much older man. She'd been 15 at the time, and she was now 17. Benjamin was conflicted. Tia was safe. She had a home and a husband. His plan to save her seemed unnecessary now. He watched her for two nights, wondering what the right course would be, and then he decided to ask Tia. Called her from the garden, and he was a, she was afraid to have her see him in the lamplight inside, afraid she'd be horrified by the changes in him. Yeah, the change being that he's whitewashed now. And she was overjoyed to see him, having thought for five years that he was dead. Told the truth right away, explained why he'd come to find her, and he realized that she didn't need rescuing, and that and told her he would leave. Tia was awestruck by the revelation that her best friend was an actual vampire, and yet still so compassionate and so much the boy she remembered. Okay, pause here. Anytime something weird happens, everyone immediately screams demons in this world. That's exactly how it was with almost every other vampire who has a supernatural ability. They scream demons with Maggie. They scream demons and witches with Jane and Alec. They scream demons with Alice. But this one, he's actually a vampire. Oh, that's just amazing. Take me with you. Really? And considering if she thinks he's a vampire, she's not going to say, oh, he's so still com so compassionate. No, her first thought should be, oh my god, he's come back to come and get me and he's trying to enchant me. Really? She's as dumb as Bella when it comes to finding out about vampires. So he tells her all about it and one walk is all it takes. Nope, I want to go with you. She immediately says, turn me too. Instantly. I don't even know. Benjamin gets to be wiser to convert Tia before taking her back to Amun, meaning he thinks his father figure might kill her. Yeah, I can tell you think of him as a father. And he bites her and changes her fine. He's only five years old. Do they have trouble or do they not? And then as soon as she was transformed, Benjamin took her hunted, hunting. When she was satiated, they went back to Amun's temple. Oh, good. You're awake now. Let's go murder a bunch of people. Okay, honey. I love you, too. Oh. Our heroes... Amun was at first enraged, but quickly calmed down as Benjamin explained. No harm had been done. Having Tia with him as a vampire removed Benjamin's one tie to the human world, and he had proven he could be relied upon on the outside world. Coven began to live a little more normally, though always with the greatest secrecy possible, and Benjamin was very happy in his coven with Tia as his mate. Tia did not question Amun's motives, because he, like Amun, is really stupid. <sighs> and really, it all makes up for it right here with his uh, famous quote. It's a pity you couldn't replace my will with your own in the process, then perhaps you would have been satisfied with me. Referring to how Amun's mad at him because he wants to stay with the Cullens. You know what he's trying to do. In the story, he says he won't be used, and yet Amun's clearly using him, and they're arguing over it. How do you not know this, and why do you continue to regard him as a father and not question his motives? You are stupid. And his last quote, apparently I'm a hot commodity. It appears I have to win the right to be free. Yes, free to have Amun keep you in a hole for five years in a row and be turned against your will. Yeah, you're free. All right, moving on to Kebby, turned by Amun. She has a faint olive cast to her pale skin, denoting the darkness of her human skin. Seriously, Meyer, stop that. All right, Kebby was chosen by Amun. Remember, this is the one I said keep in mind. Kebby was chosen by Amun from his human slaves because of her beauty and total loyalty to her master. Even after her conversion, the relationship was never one of equals. When Amun decided to bow to the Volturi's demands, Kebi followed his lead without question. She would have done the same had he decided to defy the Volturi and end both their lives. Guys, Kebi is a slave! A lot of people I've seen yell about Kebi, how she never says anything, how she's always in Amun's shadow, you know, how he treats her like property. Well, there you go. There's your answer. Why? Because she is property. She's a sex slave. She's not his mate. She is his sex slave. She's property. And the reason I emphasize this is because I'm going to reread this. When Amun decided to battle the Volturi's demands, Kebi followed his lead without question. She would have done the same had he decided to defy the Volturi and end both their lives. That uh, unquestioning, willfully following into death sort of thing, no matter what the decision, that sounds real familiar, doesn't it? Meyer, it's not a good idea to show that... One of your vampires, who's supposed to be the bad good guy, his mate is a sex slave that he chose deliberately because she was completely brainwashed and worshipped him when it sounds exactly like the relationships you've set up with the Cullens. Bad idea. 
And Kebby has little emotion for anyone besides Amun. Benjamin, she tolerated because he made Amun happy, but she was somewhat jealous of the boy. When Benjamin brought Tia home, Kebby was pleased. She hoped Amun would be less entranced by the boy when it was clear he loved Tia more than Amun. Kebby's hopes about that rift were not entirely fulfilled, as Benjamin continued to love Amun as a father, but Amun's jealousy of Benjamin's affections, though well concealed, was enough to make Kebby content. <coughs> uh, oh, yeah. Sometimes there's only one thing you can really say other than, wow, that's gay. And I don't mean the insult way. I mean, wow, that's gay. That's kind of like uh, Carlisle, Cupbearer Aro, and Carlisle making Edward his catamite kind of, wow. Ew. Why does Meyer always write these? She's incapable of writing father-son relationships. She writes the Araminos. All right, that's Kevin. We got one left. Let's finish up. Hello, Tia. He was born three years after Benjamin, between 1970 and 1800, and was transformed five years after Benjamin's transformation at age 17. She doesn't even provide a date for that one. And again, we have the indicating the darkness of her skin. We got it, Meyer. I don't think she does this for anyone else, by the way. Tia had a very large family. She was one of many children. Yeah, I got that from the first part of that sentence. Her overwhelmed and financially distraught mother began placing her children in the care of her second cousin, Benjamin's great uncle, when she could no longer feed them. Tia was given away when she was five. She had a good singing voice and nimble fingers, so her uncle kept her with him. When she was seven, Benjamin came to live with the uncle. They fell in love when he was ten and she was seven. Oh, this is icky. I'm sorry. I know that can happen, and it's done, been done better elsewhere, but Meyer wrote imprinting. Ugh. She's the one who suggested that... Uh, he showed the uncle his ability with fire. So basically, this is all Tia's fault? Lovely, we know who to blame. And yes, as the years passed, their close friendship became more serious, and they planned to someday run away together. Now, I'm sorry, that's nasty! I can't help it, because it's Meyer! I probably wouldn't be as bugged if this wasn't Meyer, but it is Meyer! Ugh! All right, when the uncle's body was found, everyone assumed he was dead, and Tia was devastated, because that's what you're supposed to do. She had all the money that she and Benjamin had saved when their plans to run away, and the mother was happy to let her stay with such a contribution. She can continue performing and stealing to help her family, and after a few years, Tia's mother was offered a dowry for the girl, which she accepted, and she was married to a clerk for a shipping company and taken to Suez. Her circumstances were more comfortable than at home, and she was not unhappy. However, she did not love her husband because, you know, you just don't get over your first love at age 12. You just never do. And you're not allowed to love your husband because if you love him... In any way, shape, or form, or get to love him, that means you can't love Benjamin anymore. It's just no, no, no. And when she saw Benjamin in her garden, Tia didn't question for a second that she would be leaving with him. Because, you know, I don't care. Though she was totally unprepared for his changed appearance or revelations, none of it made a difference. I think it makes a difference when you find out the guy you loved is now killing people for his sustenance. And that now he's a vampire, which in any culture is generally regarded as a monster. And when she realized she couldn't effectively stay with him as a human, she was willing to become a vampire. Why? You met him when you were seven. You were with him till you were 12 and you thought he was dead. And that's five years later. Why? I don't understand this. Why are people so eager to do this? And don't take true love because F you if you do. Tia never embraced Amun or Kebi as fully as Benjamin had because apparently she's got a little bit of a brain. She could see that like the uncle, Amun was interested in Benjamin because of what he'd get out of him. Yeah, duh, and Benjamin can't? Why can't Benjamin realize this? I don't get it. Everyone else knows but Benjamin. He's an idiot. Thank you, Cass. But as long as Amun's goal was to save his hearse to keep Benjamin safe, she had no problem staying with this coven. Well, as long as you're willing to use him in a way that keeps him safe, I'm okay with it. Uh. So yeah, that is the Egyptian coven. <laughs> What a bunch! We've got the um, the power-hungry psycho who had sex slaves and regular slaves and kept humans as cattle and set himself up as a god and is really mad that he's not like that anymore and is working his way to get back into that position of power, meaning enslave humans again. We've got uh, Benjamin, who, as we know from Breaking Dawn, has let his power go to his head and is an arrogant ass. We've got Kevy, the devoted sex slave, 
And we've got Tia, who was the cause of all this in the first place. And who is apparently just like Bella when it comes to, I'm not going to think about what turning into a vampire means, so long as I get to be with the guy I fell in love with at age 10. I wonder why I can't help but think of a wooden plank when I hear that. Yeah, that romance didn't work in Star Wars, and it didn't work here. And sorry if any Star Wars fans out there want to yell at me now for that, but I'm not a Star Wars fan. I like Darth Vader, not that. So, that's it. <clears throat> I'm moving away from them now. We're done for the day. Next up, we're going to have the Nomads. Two of them are pretty much non-entities, so it shouldn't take too long. And we're also going to do Garrett, like I said, even though Meyer put him in the Denali tribe. And then we're going to do Alistair last. Yeah, Alistair. I will not lie. I'm looking forward to him because he's really funny. <laughs> I'll see you there, folks. Bye.